All right, work. You've probably computed work in physics already. I know that we did it in pre-calculus class, pre-calculus 2. So what we did in pre-calculus 2 is we had a force and some displacement vector. And basically, you computed how much the force contributed to the direction, the displacement direction, and then multiplied them together. So it turned out to be basically a dot product. The thing we're going to change now is the force won't necessarily be constant. So what you did before is the force was always the same the entire time that whatever object was moving. So now the force uh, will not be constant. And so we can't just compute the uh, product of the two, whether it's dot product or just multiplying. So what we're going to do instead <coughs> is think about this in terms of uh, areas. So if I write the basic uh, work equation in the good old days when uh, the force was parallel with the direction, it was basically F times D. And if we graph this out, if this amount right here was the displacement, and let's say your force was this much, what does F times D represent geometrically? It's this area that I'm filling in right now. So the area of that green rectangle would be the work you did to move the horizontal distance using the force that it's represented with that vertical distance. So does like math and physics like interlap a little bit? Oh yeah. Physics is math. Absolutely. Uh, so let's have a purity, an academic purity uh, discussion. So the mo well, you could say philosophy is the most pure, but who cares about philosophy? <laughs> All right. So math is basically just looking at patterns and how things are related. Whether or not you have word problems doesn't matter. Math is the most pure, and then physics. What is physics? <laughs> well, I didn't ask how you feel about it. <laughs> it's the application of math. So physics is applied math. If I could spell. And then as you move to less pure fields, this is not saying that they're better or worse. Actually, as you get less pure, they're really more applicable to the real world. Uh, chemistry is next. Chemistry is applied physics. Right? You have electric charges, all that, ions, other things that I forgot. The biology So what is biology? It's applied chemistry. That's biology in a nutshell. This is very, very basic, though. This is boiling it down to like the bare essentials. So biology is basically applied chemistry. I don't know what comes after biology. I guess you could study like ecology, uh, oceanography, which is larger systems. It's how different biological systems are interacting on a larger scale. But I'd probably just call that physics. Yeah. Yeah, they're all. I think they're all just physics, basically. I mean, you get into physics of materials, physics of other things. Um, you know, if you take aeronautics classes, it's a physics of air and how it interacts with other objects. So, I would just call them all physics. Which, if you decide you don't want to go into engineering anymore, physics is a really good. Uh, major without retaking a huge number of classes. If you wait till your senior year, you don't like engineering, and you decide to be an English major, you're probably going to be uh, <laughs> middle of your sophomore year. You're going to come back two years. So. so yeah, physics or math are a good uh, off-ramp if you're going down the engineering route and you don't decide you don't like to do it. You can totally change your major to English, but the sooner you do it, the better. If you're going to wait until your last year in an engineering program to change, you better change to something similar. All right, I better erase this before some <laughs> science professors get upset. All right, so we're going to get back to work. 
It was a joke. <laughs> Not intended to be laughed at. <laughs> All right. We're going to look at displacement, but this time it's not going to be the exact same force the entire time. So let's say your force is going to change like this. Good news is the amount of work is easy to compute. It's the area. So the work, I should probably label W inside there. So in this case, that's W. It's the area of this shape right here. That's pretty much every calculus problem. It's just how you think about it. <laughs> um, I mean, it depends on how you want to think about your force. Like, I'm drawing the force as basically a vector pointing straight up, kind of. And <clears throat> depending on what you're doing. I'm sure if you're moving through a magnetic field, you need to be in different numbers of dimensions. And I don't know much about magnetism, but... Different things happen with forces if you're going to do, um, you know, gravity versus magnetism versus whatever other forces are out there. Is that more of a real world physics, like real problems, like real life problems, like you have different variables of like things that are affecting your. Yeah, so maybe you have a particle moving through a, f a, f a f magnetic field where the field's not constant. There's different magnets in different places, so the force is going to change depending on position. So that's where you would, you need to model the forces, how they are going to be at every position, and then you could calculate the work to move through. All right, so this is how we're going to compute work. So it's really easy to write down the formula. If this is y equals f of x from a to b, work is the integral fx dx from a to b. That's it. So it's basically an area problem. And that's why, we, that's why I say physics is basically applied math. So we're computing area, but it represents different things. So now it's not really an area because one of the dimensions is a force, not a distance. So I think the units are, uh, what are some common units? Meters. No, well that's his velocity. How about foot pounds? So foot pounds. That's, that's a torque. Uh oh, is it? A, that's a torque. No, foot pounds. Yeah, it's torque. What's the n? Is that foot pounds? N is that's Newton. That's so it's that's, that's, that's kilograms over meters. Over, that's mass times acceleration. Is joule? Joules is energy. Newton. Newton is a force. So you guys are in physics class. Yeah. So what units do you measure work in? <laughs> it's supposed to be a distance multiplied by whatever units you're measuring your force in. I think it's foot pounds. Pounds is a force. Is it joules, bro? It's joules. I still understood. Is joules a foot? One joule is one foot pound. I don't know. Joules. Joules are power. Let me tell you right now. Don't tell Trey about this. I'm reporting back to your physics professor. Joules is Newton's times meters. But then oh, power is joules over seconds, which is watts. It's a kilograms times mass square over seconds squared. And yeah, kilograms meters squared over seconds squared times newton. So what's, I know you probably never use an imperial system because it's hideous. Yeah, no, not in physics, we don't. All right. Whatever a foot pound is, it has a name. None of us know it. I'm never taking a physics class again, so I'm not terribly foot pound, yeah, we don't interested. We use kilogram meters. Yeah, you probably use, you want to use a metric system if you're actually solving problems. Wait, megapascal, megapascal? Maybe. Oh man, I thought it was. Foot pounds like what you tighten up a car. What's that? What you say? Kips? What do you I don't know. Right. Let's stop guessing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
All right, you've seen Hooke's Law, hopefully. If not, we'll write it down right now. All right, I am not assuming that all of you are in, have taken physics before, so I'm gonna use very limited examples. The only two laws we'll use, one of them will be Hooke's Law, and the other one basically is gonna be gravity. So we'll write, we'll do problems that involve either one. You can of course compute work with other uh, physics laws, but I'm not assuming all of you have taken physics, so I don't want to use all the different uh, physics laws. So we'll just look at the spring, uh, how springs work first, and then we'll do uh, some gravity problems after. All right, what's Hooke's law? It's the force. One half k, like displacement of x squared. It's something like that. Yes. Yeah. Something. It will. Yeah, we'll turn into that. Uh, so the force F to displace a spring x distance are proportional. Now, just a historical note, this used to be the way almost every theorem was written. Not using algebra, but using English. So this used to be math right here, the way math was written down for a very long time, until pretty recently. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to do is write down what this means in algebraic notation. So the force, oh, I didn't even put a verb in this sentence. Oh, R proportional, there we go. All right, this is why English is bad. All right, so what this, <coughs> this is gonna relate the force to the displacement of a spring. So it's relating force to displacement of a, sp of a spring. We're gonna move, uh, displace the spring X. Proportional means there's a constant, they're off by a constant. So basically if one increases, the other one increases. Unless your constant is negative, then one increases and the other one decreases, depending on what, if your constant is positive or negative. So this is how they're related. K is called the spring constant. So I'm sure you're never bored in calculus class, but maybe if you're in another class and you're bored, you take your pen apart, you find a little spring inside, and it's super flimsy, very easy to break. Uh, if you take your racing motorcycle apart, you'll find big springs in there, and you probably couldn't even compress them at all because they're so strong. Uh, so there is a huge variety. Your garage door springs kind of in between the two. So it really just depends on the type of metal, how thick it is, all that fun stuff. Slinky is an example of a spring with a super low spring constant. It's incredibly easy to deform a slinky. You almost don't even notice it. It's the constant is so small. And so to open up a slinky it takes almost no force. Uh, so this K can vary a huge amount depending on what spring you're dealing with. All right. The other tricky part of this rule, or this law, is it a law? It is a law. So this is the part I want you to pay attention to. Displace the spring X distance. So what this means, <clears throat> if you just put the spring on a table sideways, it will have a displacement of zero. So displacement zero is also called the natural length. If there's no force acting on it and the spring's just hanging out, that's called the natural length. Uh, so we'll write that down here, natural length. is when there are no forces acting on the spring. So generally that means put the spring on a uh, table sideways or something. In a perfect world you would eliminate gravity and friction, but that's an expensive operation unless you have your own spaceship. So you can just put it down on some surface that has very low friction. Uh, springs that are super strong, like a spring on, from a motorcycle, pretty much it's always going to be the natural length, uh, no matter how uh, you hold it. Motors take a lot of force to displace it. 
Yeah, it takes a huge amount of force on those springs. All right, so that's a natural length. So if you want to draw a spring like this, so let's say this is the, I'll use L for the length. And let's say you take the same spring and you compress it down to this much right here. So let's call this, uh, we'll call that M. What will this displacement be on this spring? Yeah, so it's big minus small. So this displacement, so X is the displacement. So on this one, I assume that uh, M was smaller than L. So we're compressing the spring. I could very easily, uh, well, I shouldn't say very easily, but you can extend a spring or stretch a spring, in which case uh, M might be significantly bigger than the original length. And so in this case, you would, and we have to decide which one's positive and which one's negative. It doesn't really matter which you choose. You just have to be consistent. <clears throat> so you could do the same, you want to do the same L minus M, be consistent. One of these will be positive and one will be negative, basically. I think the way I set it up, negative would be stretching, positive would be compressing. You just, just like in a problem, you pick which direction's up, you generally pick the opposite direction of gravity, unless for some other reason, maybe you're. We use the L. Oh. Okay. In well, I don't really do much physics, so yeah, you basically pick which direction <laughs> is up, and that will determine if you pick, you know, up is pointing towards the ground, then gravity's pulling in a positive direction. So this just comes down to your orientation. How do you want to think? Do you want to think uh, stretching is positive and uh, compressing is negative, or vice versa? So it's really up to you. The difference is if you switch the two, you'll get a negative work at the end versus positive. Not a big deal. All right, so there's Hooke's Law. Let's go ahead and do some problems using Hooke's Law. So we'll do our spring problem first, and then we'll do our gravity problem second. So find a work to compress a spring. So we're gonna go from one foot to three quarters of a foot. Oh, we're using imperial measurements. All right. So from one foot to three quarters of a foot, if K equals 16 pounds per foot, and natural length, is, let's go with two feet. So one thing to notice is the, the spring is already starting compressed pretty far. Spring's already starting compressed, but I want to know from that compressed length to compress it even more, how much work does it take to go from basically compressing it from one foot down to three quarters of a foot? So what I need first is I need to know displacements. The displacements are not written on the board. So I need to know what's the initial displacement and the final displacement. So that's the first thing we need to get. And that's really the only tricky part on these problems, is turning measurements into displacements. So I want to know initial displacement and final displacement. It doesn't matter if you want to go positive or negative for compression. It's up to you. Just be consistent. These are both compressions. So either make them both negative displacements or both positive displacements. You don't want to have one negative, one positive. All right, so find the two displacements right now.
any questions on the initial displacement being one foot and final five fourths? I'm not sure. I'm just copying out of my notes. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the, hopefully those units are, I'm pretty sure, well I know you guys don't, maybe I should switch my units for future classes to all metric stuff. Well this is just display, displacement, so there's only distance. Yeah, so our displacements are distance, I think he's talking about the, the spring constant oh. units, which is definitely not just a, it's a... Oh, okay. I think a force divided by uh, distance. All right, so we're ready to set up our work. So we're going from initial to final. So I'll just write the AB FX DX. So integral from one to five fourths. So our FX is just our KX right here. So this is from Hooke's law right there, our force. Just looking back to Hooke's Law, wherever that was, I'm using this right here. That's our force. So K is 16 for our spring. So go ahead and integrate this. It should be a pretty easy integral and then plug in the endpoints. Questions on this nine halves right here. I know in this case our integral was super easy to do. The only hard part was getting the displacements correct. All right, whatever units this is, it's probably something to do with feet and pounds. All right, so that's the work. Now <clears throat> we're going to use the same spring. I'm going to compress it the same amount, but I want to go from natural length to one fourth less than natural length. So I want to compress the same amount, but taking the spring from where it naturally would be one quarter less. All right. Do you think it's going to be easier, take less work to compress the spring the same amount from its natural length or to compress the spring when it's already really compressed? Natural length. It's going to be way easier to compress it from its natural length. All right, so we're gonna go do that computation right now. So that'll be our next example. So if I were to compress the same spring, so a k equals 16 from natural length, which we said was two feet, one quarter foot less. So same two pieces of information we need, initial displacement and final displacement. All right, what is our initial displacement? Zero. Zero. So we're just leaving the spring alone, and it's just two feet, which means it's not being displaced at all, or zero displacement. 
the most common mistake I see is uh, the length written down for displacement instead. So you want to just be very careful about that. All right, how do I get the final displacement? It would be one fourth. And you can choose should it be positive or negative one fourth. So we are compressing the spring. And just looking down here, when we compressed it before, I had them all positive. So to be consistent, I want a compression to be positive here. So the way we're choosing, if I did a stretch, it would be negative. So we're going to do one fourth is our final displacement. So it's the exact same. Integral, just different endpoints. We're going 0 to 1 fourth, 16x dx. So compute this out. So in this case, it only took one half. So it was nine times more difficult to compress that spring that was already under a huge amount of compression. All right, so those are the only two problems I have for springs. So we're going to move on to gravity now. We have done some gravity problems before. Uh, what, when we did gravity, we did it in integrals in Calc 1 where we had the force of gravity and we basically, that was the acceleration. Why did I say force? The acceleration of gravity. And then we computed the force or the velocity and then computed how that changed the position. So we use it with antiderivatives. So let's go ahead and write the next problem down. This is gonna be a gravity example. So we have a five pound bucket it is lifted. Twenty feet using oh well, let's do two hundred feet. Twenty feet's boring. Two hundred feet using a rope. So outside of the physics lab, any rope you use is gonna have some weight to it. So there is really no such thing as a rope that doesn't have any weight. So this is a little more realistic than um, having a weight zero rope. So this rope's going to weigh 0 0.08 pounds per foot. And if you notice, it's the same units we saw before. Not a coincidence. Things would be a little different in the metric system. You would have some, uh, I don't know, I'm not worried about units. All right. <clears throat> How much work is required to lift the bucket and the rope? All right, let's draw a picture. I'll do a before, during, and after picture. So I'll draw three pictures. So we're lifting a bucket 200 feet. So we'll say that that distance is 200 feet. Maybe somebody's on top of a building or something like that. So we got 200 feet is that vertical measure. So initially, we have that rope going down. Let's get a nice rope color. So we got a rope dropping down. And then our bucket, and everything in physics we draw as a point. So that's good enough. There's our bucket at the bottom. All right, let's draw uh, in between the beginning and end. So let's put our bucket somewhere in between like this. And then I'll draw the final. Right there. So there's beginning, middle, end. 
All right, one thing that we're lifting is the bucket. Is the bucket gonna change just the bucket? Is just the bucket gonna change weight? No. Nope. Now the rope, well, the information I gave you about the rope is basically not quite the density, but the, or is that the density? The volume. Volume, not quite volume. I guess density. It feels like density. It's probably something a little different, but it's basically how much the rope weighs per you know, unit per foot. So one thing I want you to see here, there's a different amount of rope that we're pulling up at different times. At the very beginning, you have to lift 200 feet of rope. So you're pulling way harder at the beginning than you are at the end. At the end, all you have is a five pound bucket. So the last you know, time you pull it up, all you're carrying is the bucket. Um, and then of course, different times, you have different amounts of rope. So the bucket is gonna be a constant weight, but the rope's gonna change. So we need to account for that. So that's why this problem is not the same amount of force the entire time. If we had a magic rope that didn't weigh anything, I would not need calculus to figure this one out. But <clears throat> we have a different uh, amount of rope hanging down. Uh, if you ever try to climb a tall ladder with a uh, hose, I do that occasionally. Your hose gets really heavy if it's filled up with water. So if you have to climb really far, you empty your hose out, climb up, and then shoot the water through. Uh, but that's the one time you can notice it. Um, sometimes people in the gym use like chains or big ropes to change the amount of weight depending on how high it is off the ground. And they're using the same exact principle. The higher up it is, the more chain or rope that you're lifting, basically. All right, let's go ahead and try to get the force. <clears throat> what variable should I use here? I could use x, but what might be a little more natural to use? We use y. So we got a vertical measurement. Let's just go with a y here. So I think a natural thing to choose for y is the height of bucket. And my f of y, the function I'm going to create of y, is going to be the force used at that height. So good news is the bucket's always going to be five. So there's, well, let's write it out. Let's do bucket plus rope. So that's what we have to hold up, the bucket and the rope. So bucket's always five, five pounds. All right, how in the world do I figure out how much the rope weighs? So we're going to use that 200, and then how much. So we need to know how much the rope weighs. So if we look at the picture, uh, when y is 0, so this right here, y equals 0, how much rope? 200. And at the end, when y equals 200, how much rope? We got 0. So we're going to use 200 minus uh, y is the amount of rope. So this is the number of feet of rope. And now what I'm gonna do is multiply it by the, what I call density, I'm sure there's some other, is that mass distribution? No, probably getting warmer. I think it is density. It seems like it should be density. It sounds like it's mass per volume. Mass per volume? Ah, so we're in, so it's mass per linear measure. So it's some other, it's basically density in a different dimension. Yeah, it took away two dimensions. There's probably some name for it. All right, so the weight of the rope is 0 0.08. And this is pounds per foot. And I totally, I'm going to write my foot measure right here on my rope calculation. So this guy is 200 minus y feet. All right, so we got feet of rope multiplied by weight per foot. Now if we look at the units here, just looking at the units, what are the units here? What do they cancel out to be? Just pounds. 
So just using a unit analysis, we're, we basically just wrote a pound uh, equation that's going to measure pounds, how much this weighs. So we have 5 plus 200 minus y times 0 0.08. And this whole thing is measured in pounds. You know what other letters are not in pounds? <laughs> L and B. <laughs> you know what letter is in pounds? <laughs> S. <laughs> Unless I'm misspelling one of those two. I'm pretty sure I'm not, though. There's pro I don't know why they use LB. There's some reason. Probably. Probably. Probably the same reason we had pH equals F in English. All right, so all you need to do is work. Uh, to compute the work, it's F, Y, D, Y. What is the initial and final Y values? We're just going 0 to 200. So this looks a little bit ugly. However, this is really just a polynomial in Y. There's a constant term and a degree one term. That's it. There'll be some fractions or decimals depending on how you deal with it, but it's an easy integral to compute. Is that a kinematic equation? What's that? Can I say kinematic equation except there's no acceleration? Never mind. It looks kind of like it's going to be one of those kinematics. Yeah, kinematic Possible. I don't know too much physics, so uh, I'm not going to say what it's similar to because I don't have enough experience in physics <laughs> to say. That class is fun. All right, so this is the end of work right here. So I will ask you either a spring question or a question that involves gravity, pulling something through uh, with a different amount of weight. And I want to know how much is a total amount of work to move it. That'll be on Friday.